You're now listening to the Boys in the Booth podcast with your hosts, Harper Cody, Chad Melbourne, and Casey Abrams. New episodes every Monday on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. All right, good evening. Welcome back to the Boys in the Booth podcast. This is episode 138. Cody, Abrams, Melbourne, the big three, all back after a nice break. And uh, guys, it's nice to to see your faces. It's nice to be chatting with you again. It feels like we haven't done this in forever, all three of us. Uh, How are we doing on this Monday night? Oh, doing really well, Harp. It's been a nice little break. Um, been super busy, and I'm going to continue to be busy. I'm leaving for Vancouver tomorrow for six days. And uh, I just got back from Ottawa, seeing Zach Bryan uh, play there. That was exciting. That's at Folk Fest at Lansdowne Park. Um, yeah, it's just a lot going on. And now we're getting into, in my opinion, the most wonderful time of the year. They say Christmas. Well, I say when it has... NHL hockey, NBA going, NFL, MLB playoffs, Premier League's on, Champions League is in full effect. All of the sports that I care about are on. I mentioned NBA because some people care about that. I couldn't give two shits. (laughs) But everything else that I just said, super exciting for me. Great time of the year. Love, love, love September, October, November. What a what a hot start after taking two weeks <laughs> off, just coming right in, no nonsense, letting the fans know exactly what kind of podcast we are. We're no bullshit podcast in case he doesn't like the NBA. And I uh, can't say I disagree with you there. Uh, okay, <laughs> boys, what a two weeks it's been. Like, I, I started school again, so I've been busy with that. Um, I've been working two part-time jobs each one day a week, which has also been busy. Um, I've been been working on the video the pepsi cup video which is really close to being finished the problem is i keep having to delete shit off my computer to make enough space for all of the footage that we have there's like i don't even know like 50 gigs of raw footage that i've been working with here so it's just been a nightmare trying to you know make sense of all that and put it all together i don't even have microsoft office on my computer anymore guys that's how dire it is here but Um, Other than that, it's been good. I did want to shout out uh, a a couple guys. One, Reese Barrett for placing an order on Boys in the Booth uh, and getting some merch today. Um, Just letting everybody know we're still selling merch into October, I think until uh, almost the end of October. So make sure you go to boysinthebooth.com and check that out. And also, Jay Zucci. Jay placed a huge order on Boys in the Booth, and I think that's his third or fourth massive order. And uh, he paid me 100 bucks to shout him out on the podcast. So there you go, Jay. Uh, Thanks again for the order. So we're wrapping up with merch relatively soon, like I said, about the end of uh, October. So make sure you get all your Christmas gifts uh, before we do and keep an eye out for these next four episodes where we talk about, uh, you know, and, and predict the division rankings and also keep your eye out for the Pepsi Cup video, which will be released shortly. Holy boys, it feels like I've been in a cage and haven't talked in two <laughs> weeks. So there you go. That's my uh, little spiel to start this episode. Awesome. All right. That all sounds great. And uh, yeah, uh, guys, I, I've been busy myself. As you both know, I, I took on a second job, a, a, a part time gig with the with the Ottawa Senators, which is kind of cool. I, uh, I've heard it from you guys, from everybody that, you know, I'm a trader and and, you know, bandwagon or this and that with the kind of off season they've had. But uh, no, it, it's been a lot of fun. Um, just a, a, a cool little story. Got to meet Mark Mathot. He was at rally fest uh um at uh, canadian tire uh, over the weekend and that was really cool and so just got chatting with him and uh he kind of stopped me for a second and said uh you know by chance do you do like any radio or podcast stuff because you've got a great voice and then we went and played ball <laughs> hockey with the kids and that was really cool so um anyway having a blast with that and been super busy as well but uh, yeah our, our very own harper cody has been on the ottawa senator uh social media i don't know stories in the last days it's it's been pretty 
surreal to see all over it mr ottawa senator himself he's been a sense fan since he was born and at least that's what he told them in the interview so harp that's awesome <laughs> i was wondering if you asked uh mark Mathot, uh, uh you know about the time that he tried to gouge out Sidney crosby's eyes did that come up you know after no, crosby slashed his finger off the year prior no no it didn't come up at all but uh yeah i just uh no it didn't come up at all but <laughs> that may be a, a good question for the next time i see him yeah <laughs> next time we have him on the podcast for sure yeah no man uh we didn't get into the whole crosby and the the thumb incident but uh super nice guy he's got his own podcast funny enough so anyway if we're lucky enough to get him on sometime maybe we can plug his as well uh the one that he does with with brent wallace uh uh, who used to be with TSN. And so anyway, no, we didn't get into all that stuff, but a uh, great chat with him. Super nice guy. And it was cool that he was at the event on uh, Saturday. Yeah, that is cool. And speaking of like what I was mentioning earlier with the space on my laptop, we're recording this through Skype and Harper is. So we're really, really hoping that this is going well. So if any technical issues come up, just blame it on the Pepsi Cup video going forward. All right, let's get into it, boys. All right, sounds good. So uh, our first of the four divisions that uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to start with the Pacific Division, as we uh, as we always do. And so we'll just go one through eight and uh, give our, our rankings and our thoughts and predictions. And away we go. So uh, let's start with the Calgary Flames, guys. And if there was an award given out for, like, best turnaround offseason season it would 100% have to go to Brad Tree Living and company in Calgary. Pretty tough situation when both of your star players decide to walk away in one summer. Johnny Gaudreau goes to Columbus. Matthew Kachuk goes to Florida. And instead of pouting about it, Tree Living goes and arguably makes this hockey team better somehow gets Jonathan Huberto and Mackenzie Weger in the Kachuk deal with Florida, and then also goes out and signs Nazem Kadri. And so um, I- I'm looking at the Flames on paper with with a strong back end that they have, with Weger being added into the mix, Huberto and Kadri signed long-term, and uh, Jacob Markstrom being a-, a great goaltender. And I've got these guys finishing at the top of the Pacific. So... Let's have a thought on the Calgary Flames, and uh, Chad, we'll go to you first. Huge shout out to SeatGeek for sponsoring the podcast. SeatGeek is a ticket app that takes all the confusion out of buying tickets. SeatGeek makes it extremely simple to buy tickets to all of your favorite sporting events, including Jays and Leafs games, and you can always find a great deal. On SeatGeek, all tickets are scored on a scale between 0 and 10, so you know if you're getting a good or a bad deal. Green is good and red is bad. Plus, Boys in the Booth listeners get $20 off their first ticket purchase on SeatGeek with the promo code Boys in the Booth in all caps. So click the link in the description to download the app and remember to get your discounted tickets using the code Boys in the Booth in all caps. Get great seats for a fraction of the cost with SeatGeek. Summer is here and you know what that means. Extreme sports like spike ball and road hockey have returned and so is day drinking. The problem is we're not as young as we used to be and these summer activities can be draining on our bodies. When you push your body hard or just feel run down, it's extremely important to stay hydrated. When you make hydration a priority, it helps you feel healthier on a day-to-day basis. Enter Liquid IV. Whether you're playing sports or nursing a hangover, Liquid IV has you covered. One stick of Liquid IV in 16 ounces of water hydrates faster and more efficiently than water alone. It contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C with three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. It's made with premium ingredients, non-GMO, and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. The kicker? The stuff tastes good too, guys. Liquid IV has incredible hydration flavors like watermelon, strawberry, pina colada, and more, but my personal favorite is lemon lime. So get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code BOYS underscore IN underscore THE underscore BOOTH in all caps at checkout. So that's 25% off anything when you order using the promo code BOYS underscore IN underscore THE underscore BOOTH all caps at liquidiv.com. Experience better hydration today at liquidiv.com. 
Shout out to Cocktail Bomb Shop for sponsoring the podcast. Cocktail Bomb Shop is a Canadian woman-owned small business and all of their cocktail bombs are proudly handmade in Montreal. Well, what is it and how does it work? Step one, you pick your favorite flavor of cocktail bomb and unwrap it. My favorite is definitely mojito. Step two, drop your cocktail bomb into eight ounces of sparkling water and watch it fizz for five minutes. Step three, add a shot of your favorite alcohol, some ice, and enjoy it. Fellas, gents, boyfriends of the world, these cocktail bombs make the perfect gift for your lady friend because not only are they tasty, but they're Instagrammable as well. Right now, if you go to cocktailbombshop.ca and use the code BITV15, you can get 15% off your entire order. That's cocktailbombshop.ca. Use the code BITV15 at checkout for 15% off. Yeah, so just to start off with this division, like we all kind of know it's one of the weaker divisions. I do think it got better this offseason. I think a lot of teams did improve, but I don't know if if this is going to be a strong division, but it will be close. Um, so that being said, I've got two teams who I ranked kind of in my my top tier who I think should make the playoffs for sure. Uh, that's Calgary and Edmonton. I've got bubble teams, uh, pretty much everybody else in the middle who could fight for a playoff spot. It wouldn't shock me if they made the playoffs. That's Vegas, L.A., Vancouver, Anaheim and Seattle. And then last place rebuilding teams i've got the san jose sharks so just prefacing that before i get into the flames here uh yeah you kind of said it like predicting them to finish number one that's what they did last year they had 111 points uh sixth in the nhl and i think they got better as well so I mean, you look at their forward group, I think maybe you could argue it's slightly worse because you'd rather have Kachuk and Gaudreau over Huberto and Kadri, those two pairs. Um, you know, but that's arguable. On D, I think they got a lot better, though, adding Mackenzie Wieger, who is one of the best defensemen in the NHL. Top 15, uh, I think, is safe to argue. And, uh, you know, it might even be the best top six group in the league i don't think that's insane to say looking at this group now and then in net they've got you know jacob markstrom old reliable uh you know one of the best goalies in the league so i agree with you there harp i think he's uh th- this team should finish number one in this division and i think it'll be between them and edmonton for number one spot but i'm taking calgary as well case what do you think yeah it's funny this off season is kind of a bit of a michael scott snip snap snip snap like for Calgary <laughs> fans, you had no clue it was coming. It was like, oh, this team's screwed. They're done for. It's rebuild time. What are we going to do about this? And then it's, oh, we got Huberto and Mackenzie Weger. Okay, maybe we have a chance. Oh, we're out of the Nazan Kadri situation. It doesn't sound like he's going to sign with us. Oh, no, we got him for way che- cheaper than anyone ever thought we were, he was going to sign for. It's like snip, snap, snip, snap. And uh, if, if, like, if you're asking me, they did get better. Um, we talked about this before when we talked about the trade initially that, you know, player for player, maybe it's not exactly one for one and, you know, maybe they're weaker there. But I think as a team, as a whole and all the assets they got in return, they're better off mostly because of culture and everything that's changed. This team now has a direction. We for three years, we were bickering and we were confused on what they should do should they rebuild back in 2019 2020 should they uh trade their top players should they keep them are they signing long term are they leaving it was just so much confusion i have to imagine there's so much weight off these players shoulders going into the season it's like okay we're here this is what we're doing let's move forward and yeah chad love the decor this is probably i'm going to put them in the top three for d depth in the whole league it's awesome up and down they might not have like you know a victor headman or a roman yossi or or kale mccarr or anything like that but depth wise this team is phenomenal and i and i love it um cheap 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 vesna caliber goalie gotta love that locked up for a couple more years and solid solid forward depth again also great down the middle everything i like about a team so i really sat here and battled trying to put edmonton in first place but every time i came back to calgary they checked off all of the casey abrams boxes and i ended up with them number one yeah i i wouldn't say it's like a no-brainer but it makes sense to put calgary number one like they had such a good year uh last year the year prior, you know, there were some struggles there, but we looked at this team on paper and and just thought, you know, they're so freaking good. Uh, you know, how can they how can they not be a contender? And now they look a bit different, but they still have 
you know, they've still got your Lindholms and then you've still got your Markstroms and the Hannafins and, you know, the, the Tanevs and the list goes on. But they look a bit different, but they're going to be just as good, if not better. And I'm looking forward to this team play because, like you said, Case, they're kind of built exactly how you want a team to be built. Yeah. I mean, Michael Backlund, for one, was their, their number two C last year on a, on a first place team. Well, he's their three C now. Like yeah. they have to feel like they're in a stronger position down the middle. They picked up Kevin Rooney. He's such a serviceable fourth line centerman. So you got to love it down the middle. And then they have scoring options on the wing. The guys that are already there in Manji Apane and Toffoli, but now you have Huber Ho, who is, you know, a 110 point scorer, Blake yeah. Coleman. We, we love him. I love him. Pickles. Yeah. He's my man. Like there's a lot to love about this team. And, I don't know. I, I can't poke any holes in them. And, and that's that's what makes it so easy for me to have them either one or two. But I sat and debated on this team more than any other team in the Pacific Division. And I had them at one. Yeah, perfect. And uh, they're still looking to add to that defensive depth. Uh, they just gave uh, Michael Stone a, a PTO and he played really well for them in, in, a, in a short amount of time last season so uh yeah i love what the flames have done in uh kind of a an up and down off season but they took a negative and turned it into a huge positive jacob pelche another young player who i think could maybe get an opportunity um uh as a as a depth player uh, in their lineup and who could score some goals this season for the flames so all right uh chad you mentioned them uh, a few minutes ago the edmonton oilers and um i'm with you it's kind of a toss-up between the two alberta teams for the top of this division this edmonton team didn't really need to do a whole lot this off season they took a huge step last year they made the final four uh obviously got swept by the Stanley Cup champion Colorado Avalanche, but they took a big step. I like the Oilers. Um, obviously, some risk to the Jack Campbell signing uh, with with that being a five year contract. But I do like Campbell. He's a, he's a good goaltender, a good person. You know him well. Obviously, uh, they locked up Evander Kane. Uh, I I don't mind the Brett Kulak deal as well, and uh, I I really like what the Oilers have have done, keeping everything together. And um, they're they're going to be a, a contender for sure. So I've got them finishing number two in this division. But uh, Chad, like you alluded to earlier, it could go either way with the two Alberta teams um, uh, going one and two in this division. So just a thought on the Oilers. Yeah, I mean, it's no surprise. I have Edmonton number two as well. Uh, I think they're going to be a good team. I don't know if they're final four good. Um, final four good is is basically you know, Dry Seidel and McDavid each scoring over two points per game. And we'll see if they can do that again in the playoffs. Like that's essentially what happened. Um, the one thing I will say is like their forward group is pretty much the same, um, but they might have the best top six in the NHL. It's it's definitely up there. Top five for sure. Top three arguable. And uh, Oilers fans will tell you it's the best in the league because of those two players. Uh, their D is, you know, kind of the same. They've got a couple younger players like Broberg and Bouchard who are going to need to take a step to kind of fill in for a veteran presence who is missing this year. And that's Duncan Keith um, because he won't be there. But I don't love their D in general, uh, but for the most part, it's OK. And on goalie. Did I lose you guys there for a sec? OK, nope. just making sure. And uh, on goalie, like they got a hell of a lot better. Replacing that tandem of Smith and Koskinen with Jack Campbell and Stuart Skinner, who is finally going to be able to show his worth in the NHL, is just incredible. Like what an upgrade. We know there's some risks with Campbell Harp, like you alluded to, um, you know, especially the money and the term. But, you know, security in the crease is something that the Oilers haven't had in forever and they're hoping that jack campbell can be that security so overall i like the oilers a lot in this pacific division um and we'll see if if dry and mcdavid can uh keep carrying this team and hopefully for edmonton's sake they can get to the same place they did last year in the playoffs yeah what i'm in the history of the boys in the booth division rankings there's been three constants every single year we don't give a shit about the Pacific. <laughs> we have a hard time doubting Connor McDavid and his team. Yeah. And we do not ever doubt the Pittsburgh Penguins. That's right. We can't. 
We have to always keep in mind those three teams or those three things. And that's why I had a hard time with the Calgary Edmonton debate is I kept wanting to go. Yeah, but McDavid's going to be angry this year. Right. And I think we say that every single year. And I don't know. I, I have a hard time putting these guys ahead of Calgary, although it's pretty much the same team. You look at the forward courts, mm-hmm. all the same guys. You look at the defense, you know, swap one guy in for Keith. What they improved on was their biggest weakness. And the thing that we talked about last year in the preseason rankings, in the uh, trade deadline review, all of these things, we always talk about their weakness being goaltending. Well, they fixed that this year. Um, So I have full confidence at locking them in at either one or two. And in my mind, too, because of Calgary, not necessarily because Edmonton. Although, like you, Chad, I do doubt their decor constantly. Yeah, like their defense, they don't really have, I don't know, like it, it seems like they're missing a piece or two, especially compared to a team like Calgary, who we just talked about, who has one of the best decors in the league. Like I look at Edmonton's defense and sure, they've got, you know, guys like Nurse and I like Bouchard a lot. Um, and, you know, like they've got guys. It just seems like, I don't know. They're missing a piece or two to make that back end complete for me anyways. Just when looking at other contenders like, you know, they had 104 points last year. They finished 11th in the entire league. Um, I think that's probably about right around where they are right now. Looking at this roster on paper, I could see them doing that again this year. And, uh, you know, they're going to be a good team, but they're going to have to outscore their opponents, uh, you know, by a wide margin every night. And that's kind of what they do, especially when they've got those two guys. And by the way, like I talked about McDavid and Dreisaitl having both over or or equal to or over two points per game in the playoffs. Dreisaitl also had a high ankle sprain. Like he could barely skate. Like it, Harp, we, we were talking about this when, you know, we listened to that 32 Thoughts interview with him. And, uh, you know, he was very frank about it. And he, he was like, listen, guys, like I couldn't skate. I had, he was the best player in the league of players who couldn't skate you know and it was by far because he was stationary he had to change his entire game so a healthy dry saddle throughout the entire year and playoffs would be the best thing for the oilers and uh man like they're definitely good they're definitely yeah. good but number two is where they they rank i have to imagine by a time of the trade deadline assistant gm Connor mcdavid is going to be stepping in and saying we need to make a move to you know strengthen the back end yeah it makes sense. I mean, they have a, a clear need now that it's not goaltending and it's, you know, depth on the blue line. So, yeah, sense. well, nowadays, depth on the blue line costs about a first round pick and a blue chip prospect. So, yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a high price for sure. By the way, uh, Evan Bouchard, 43 points last season, just a, a fantastic yeah. breakout year for him. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's it's definitely less of um it, it not as deep as of a blue line with with Duncan Keefe uh, deciding to to hang him up um but uh looking forward to watching the Oilers again this year Dylan Holloway a young player first round pick who could maybe get an opportunity as a as a depth forward as well which is uh what Edmonton uh always always could use so uh there you go all right uh, we've got the uh uh, the number three spot now with this division, and this is where things I think could open up a little bit where we could have some disagreements. Um, but I, I've got the Vegas Golden Knights in in number three for, for me in this division. And I know that there are some concerns about players like Mark Stone and Jack Eichel and others staying healthy. Obviously, with the goaltending, too, it doesn't look like uh, Robin Leonard is going to play this season. So it'll be Logan Thompson, Laurent Brossois, and they also added Aiden Hill. So they've got three goaltenders in the mix. But I really like Thompson. He's a young goaltender, especially the way that he played down the stretch for Vegas, trying to get into the postseason. Uh, Watched a great game late in the year uh, between Vegas and Dallas. And uh, just seeing Thompson and Jake Ottinger battling it out, two young goaltenders, that's who I kind of look at uh, Thompson as, uh, or sorry, I look at his comparable being uh, Ottinger. Um, I-, I could see Thompson, you know, playing his, his heart out in a, in a playoff series, like what Ottinger did for Dallas uh, against the Calgary Flames. So, yes, Vegas lost Max Pacioretty and Dylan Coughlin for literally nothing future <laughs> considerations but this is still a good hockey team 
a contender when everybody's healthy, in my opinion. I know I'm not alone there. And uh, I've got Vegas in this number three spot getting back into the playoffs. Yeah, I this is where we're going to start to differ because I have a team that I'm I'm locked at number three. You guys are talking about tiers and a lot of switching around. I'm a lock at number three and it's not Vegas. Personally, I have Vegas four, maybe five. I can swing either way, depending on how you guys push me. Um, I think that there's a lot of problems with this team in my mind. And the first one is I am not as confident in their goaltending as Harper is. Um, Obviously, he had a strong season last year, Thompson, but I don't know if it's time to put him in as a starter anywhere. Um, Also, the big caveat is when this team is healthy this team always seems to be having some sort of issue when it comes to to injury and uh, another one is nolan patrick is once again seems like he's dealing with an injury that's one that wasn't mentioned before but um that's what i'm hearing once again so i don't know i uh, there's something about this team that i don't like i think it's maybe the cancer that's starting to grow inside the locker room that is no one wants to play there because you sign a contract and get traded and they kind of disrespect their players and robin laner is always speaking out about them now they have jack eichel who kind of destroyed the buffalo sabers almost (laughs) in their dressing room it's like i don't i've got a bad omen about this team i don't know if that's enough to knock them down to four for you guys but um there's something not to love about this team. I don't know. I, I, I can't nail it down for you. Yeah. Uh, well, Case, you know, I'm sorry to have to do this, but I'm going to have to go 2v1 skis here with Harp. And uh, I'm picking Vegas for the three spot, even though I agree with a lot of what you said. I think there are a lot of holes in this team. Um, I think there were some poor decisions made this offseason, uh, giving away Max Pacioretty for nothing just so you can sign riley smith and then not address the goaltending you know losing your starting goaltender for the entire season i think we're just a few of the blunders to name a few um but like i still look at this team and i think you know they can definitely be uh competitive in this division which like we mentioned is a bit weaker there are going to be a few teams challenging for that for those three and four spots but i think vegas you know they look at their season last year And they think to themselves, you know, the problem was we just weren't healthy and assuming things go well and getting Jack Eichel for an entire season, as opposed to, you know, 10 games, 20 games, whatever he played at the end of the year where he just wasn't healthy. Maybe it was more like 30, but he just didn't look like himself. So getting him for a full season, I think, makes sense. And same with Stone. Um, I just think there will be a different air around this team. You know, now that they kind of rode off last season and, you know, we think about Vegas as a team who missed the playoffs finally. Right. Like they were finally bad. They finished 17th in the league like they just just missed the playoffs by a few points. So I don't think this team has gotten so much worse that now they're fighting for a spot and it's and it's that uncertain. Um, I think there still is some uncertainty surrounding this team, especially in net. But I think, you know, as long as as the season goes on here and they get guys like Brassois back and, you know, cause Brassois and Thompson is a decent tandem. I don't love Thompson Hill Hutchinson, that trio that they're going to have going to start the year. But once Brassois is back, you know, him and Thompson, I don't mind that tandem at all. I think the comparable to, to Ottinger Thompson to Ottinger may be a stretch heart, but I see where your head's at, you know, an an up and coming guy who kind of needed to take on a role that, you know, became available to him through injuries. So I do have some concerns with this team, but overall, like, I think they're still going to be in the mix. And the number three spot to me makes sense. Um, I'd be willing to move it if it weren't 2v1 skis against you case, but uh, we're going to have to do that. So Vegas in the third spot. My, my argument isn't so strong against Vegas. It is for the other team. The other team. Who I know exactly who you're going to put. What I will say about this team is that I think that teams started figuring out how to pick apart this team defensively last year and that's what we saw uh now they have a weaker goaltending situation i also think that a lot of people are still living in the past about this team i think that riley smith is not the guy that they brought on first year second year i think that william carlson's not even close to the guy the first year of vegas i think that march so had a great bounce back year but i don't know if he's going to be at 66 points or whatever he was again this year i just there's a lot of questions about this team and for me that's enough in my mind to put them lower than the la kings 
Yeah, and that's who you have now in the fourth spot. So why don't you talk about them? Oh, I have them in the third spot. Yeah, but now because you got beat out 2v1 skis, they're in the fourth spot. Yeah, this is always, this is going to be one of those ones that I clip and I put in my you know personal <laughs> diary at the end of the year when the LA Kings actually end up coming second for some reason. Oh, I, this LA Kings team was a 99 point team playoff or playoff team last year, and I think they're better this year. They picked up Kevin Fiala now. They still have kind of that same core of forwards. They have guys that took a step last year, and that's what you really needed from them. Adrian Kempe was a whole different player, setting career highs in like goals and assists. Uh, I have follow, continue to do what he does. They have a last like a fourth line of just kids that are all expecting to blow up. And then there's other ones that are already have taken another step, like Blake Lazat and Arthur Kaliev. And I don't know there's a lot to like on forward for this team. And then think about that. They were a 99 point team without Drew Doughty for a full season, who was on a, a Norris trophy run before yeah. he went down with injury. Um, and now you have Jonathan Quick back to prime. I don't know if that's going to continue, but it doesn't matter if it does because they have Cal Peterson as well. I really like this team. I like what they're building. They have maybe the best prospect pipeline in the league, and they're a playoff team. This is the beginning of a Tampa Bay esque team, in my in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, you'd, you'd certainly hope so with all the, the picks that they've had. They have a lot of good players coming up and a lot of guys who are already on the roster who are good. I love the Fiala ad. You know, I couldn't believe they couldn't get something done in Minnesota. I know the money didn't work, but, uh, you know, maybe it's because you bought out two players for like 60 mil against the cap. Have to bring that up every time I mention Minnesota. But uh, yeah, dude, I like L.A. And I actually went back and forth for, for three and four here with Vegas and L.A. I decided on L.A. fourth um, just because I think you have a lot of players who haven't proven that they are able to take the next step yet. Like a guy like Byfield, what are we going to get from him this season? I'd love to see, you know, 50, 50, 60 points. We know he's capable of that, but he just hasn't shown it yet. So to me, and, and same for guys like Kaliev or, you know, Velarde, et cetera. So for me, there's just a lot of question marks still. But like you said, team got 99 points last season without their number one defenseman, uh, Drew Doughty, who was having an incredible year up until that time he got injured. I had him in fantasy in both leagues. So trust me, I know how fucking good he was. So to me, there's just some question marks. They were a really good team last year. I do think they got better, but I just think Vegas is that team that isn't just going to go away that easily. So we'll have to see. Before you jump in, Harp, I just, I want to make a counterpoint to, to, chad's you know there's a couple guys that haven't made a, t- a step point i think that ready for this one chad yeah you've probably been never been told this in your life okay i think you're taking the pessimist uh, view here and i'm taking the optimistic view and true, in terms true. of this debate vegas is the pessimist friend it's old familiar it's a bunch of guys that have been doing it for a long time but maybe you're on a downswing whereas the kings the way i'm viewing them is internal competition you know i talk about that a lot i talk about it with the devils every single year it feels feels like but the internal competition on this team is unbelievable there's a guy like alex turcott that we haven't even seen get a chance here yet because there's so many guys in in line to be entering this team i'm so excited to watch their prospect camp and, and see how that goes who's going to make this team is byfield going to step up so he can stay in the lineup is gabe velarde finally going to live up to his hype what about kupari like all these guys they're all hunger and eager to get in this team whereas i don't know if there's that type of competition in vegas i think they have you know these are the guys we've had for the last four years and then we have this solid bottom six that no one can enter because we like them we like carrier we like uh colsar or whoever is left on that vegas team i can't remember right now uh not cold yeah colsar and, yeah uh, he's How- still. yeah 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 all right i all mean right. that's that's <laughs> that's my point there is it's they're just so set in this Vegas team. Um, I don't know. I don't just not fair, a fan. Fair enough case. I mean, having um, open competition is is a great thing. And you look at this L.A. lineup and it's all kids. And then there's some veterans in there, some good quality veterans, obviously starting with Kopitar and Doughty. But, you know, they add Victor Arvidsson and Philip Deneau, who had a great season. Like you've got two 
uh, Selkie winners right there as your two. I know Dino hasn't won a Selkie yet, but he certainly could. Um, you, you have him and Kopitar as your two centers. Like that's just the defensive dream for Todd McClellan. And, um, you know, and, and then it's, and then it's all kids and adding Kevin Fiala. I think he's going to absolutely light it up there. He's a perfect fit. He's a finisher. They're a fast, hungry, exciting team. And the thing that we've seen with LA before is that they're a team that just needs to get in to the playoffs and then anything can happen. Like that's all they need is just get in. Look, they played great against Edmonton. It took them to seven games. Like that was a great series. They played really well. Casey mentioned the back end as well with, with Dowdy out and, and just so impressive seeing the guys step up. Sean Dursey, how good he was when he came up and Mikey Anderson in particular, who I thought was their best defenseman after, after Dowdy went down and Spence and, and other guys. And let's not forget they had Sean Walker out for the whole year as well. And, um, you know, a, a, a solid one, two tandem too. So, um, yeah, I, I've, I've got LA in that fourth spot just because there's still a lot of, still a lot of young guys that, you know, we're, we're looking for that next step, but this is a good hockey team, man. Maybe the most fun to watch the most exciting up tempo team in the NHL. And, and uh, I, I think they're going to get back into the playoffs again. But um, another year under their belt, they they could be uh, they could be a, a, a tough out once again. And again, yeah. just a team that needs to get in and get playing, and and they could go anywhere. Yeah, I've got kind of two more points to make about this team. The first one being that um, I think they have ten centers on this team. When I look, you know, when you look at the top 12 or the guys that are expected to play on the team, it's like 10 of them can play center and they're all pushing out to the wing. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. In my mind, it's a good thing because that's a Swiss Army knife player, not a not a winger who you're pushing at center. Um, That's kind of a throwaway comment. The second one that's kind of my my last argument to put them at third is that I think that by time of the trade deadline, they're going to be very similar in points to the Vegas Golden Knights. The difference is. Vegas is not going to be in a position to make this big push for a huge trade at the trade deadline because they've traded every first round pick, every first like player they've selected first round in their whole history. They don't have that surplus of assets to trade for a big booming trade deadline acquisition like L.A. does. L.A. is in the best situation, the best ideal situation out of the whole pacific division to go out and make a huge splash of the trade deadline and i think that is going to be the thing that pushes them above vegas is their trade line de- acquisition they're going to do trade deadline acquisition they're going to do with all the assets they have in this team and maybe some of these prospects that didn't make the opening line roster because they're just not there yet like a turcot would be on the line in my mind yeah that that's definitely a good point something i didn't consider um and also as you go along you know you've got players developing these younger guys like Turka, who you mentioned or you know whichever one of those guys internally doesn't make the team or or a handful of guys you can see different combinations all year long and kind of tinker and get your best lineup for playoff time so that's that makes sense you know kind of internal rentals uh, as if you will um so i get that they're going to have a lot of money at the deadline certainly more than vegas vegas is always up to the cap and they've got nothing to trade so Good point. I like that. Um, something to add about Vegas as well is that they they added Kessel, which I think isn't nothing. Um, he had a good season last year. Didn't score a ton of goals, but uh, you know had a boatload of assists in Arizona. And he had that comment uh, saying, you know, I'm happy to go to a team who is actually going to try to win. You know, so yeah, it's, it's he's excited to play. I I take it as he's going to be better this year, but there is the. The two-sided argument to be had there that you know maybe he had a good season last year because he was one of the good players there yeah. and then the other side of it is he's gonna have a better season this year because he has people to play with so yeah, yeah there you go all right so we got to make a decision here so the three and the four spot case uh, it's, it's, you, it's, it's not it sounds like vegas is going third but i'd like all the listeners to remember that casey had la third what i will say is that i have these two teams and the next three for that matter all in the same tier as teams who 
if they made the playoffs, it wouldn't surprise me if they missed the playoffs. Um, you know, that would be a bit tough. But, you know, I've got Vegas third, L.A. fourth. You could swap them if you'd like. But that was my original ranking. And because we came in two V one and last harp, you're going to flip uh, that. That's I think how it's going to shake out. Uh, <sighs> I, I, I'm thinking about it. I did like the trade deadline comment, but you know what? I'll I'll stick with it. I, I do like Vegas, especially if they're healthy in that three spot. But I, I had L.A. in fourth. So uh, and I'll, I'll say this, too. This is my last comment about this. These four teams. So, OK, last year in the Pacific, only three teams made the playoffs, right? Because Vegas missed. So Calgary, Edmonton, L.A. all made the playoffs. Only three teams from this division. Uh, if you're thinking, hold on, that math doesn't really make sense. Yeah, because it doesn't. Five teams from the Central made the playoffs. So this year, I'm looking at this division at least thinking four of these teams could make the playoffs, possibly even five. I'd have to look at the Central and see what's up over there. But just looking yeah. at it now, I don't think it's going to be another year where only three teams from this division make it. So those top four teams who we just talked about, I think all have a realistic good shot at making the playoffs this year. Yeah, the, this division did get a, a little bit better. So, yeah, I, I agree. I, I'm looking at, you know, an extra team or two to to make it into the postseason. OK, let's go to number five. And um, I, I'm going to assume that you guys are, are with me with with who's in this number five spot. I've got the Vancouver Canucks who uh, kind of surprised us this offseason. We thought that they were maybe going to go in a different direction that, you know, um, Brock Besser wouldn't stick around JT Miller possibly wouldn't stick around especially him I mean for months we heard trade rumors about JT Miller and what Vancouver could get for him after the monster season that he had but uh they they locked up both of them and so Vancouver I think is looking at this division and they look at the the goaltender that they have and Thatcher Demko, who very well could go out and win and win the Vesna this season. Like he's that good. And how well they've played under Bruce Boudreaux and, and everything. And so um they they obviously want to stay competitive. Didn't do a whole lot this see uh, this offseason. Um, you know, a, a, a couple of things. They did sign Ilya Mikheyev. Um, I, I don't like the the length and the the money on that contract but they did it and um you know uh they added kuzmenko from the khl as well who who could be a nice ad and another year for pod colson and so on and so forth bo horvat still isn't signed to an extension which i don't want to say is concerning but it's just kind of odd because we did hear that that was going to be their first piece of business and instead they locked up uh miller and besser before him so that that's something to watch. But um, look, this is a team that turned it right around when uh, they switched coaches. And I like Vancouver. I've got them finishing just outside of the playoffs in that fifth spot, although I could see them squeaking in. And I do think that they're going to be playing meaningful games late in the year. Uh, and that'll be because of Thatcher Demko. So uh, a thought on the Canucks, Chad. <laughs> Case you go. I want to hear what oh, you okay. have to yeah. say. Case, I go ahead. do reluctantly have these guys in the fifth spot. And I say reluctantly because they're beginning to be the Buffalo Sabres of the West. Close your ears, Harper. I'm getting so sick of this team not taking a step. Um, it's amazing that they aren't a better team yet. Like... They've had these young pieces in in the system, cracking the roster. They've had Calder winners. They've got Quinn Hughes. They, like, there's so many pieces when you look at this team, when you're like, why are they not just dominant already? And it, it, they've just been in the same spot for so long. Maybe Buffalo is not the fair comparison. Maybe it's the Minnesota Wild. But it's time for this team to step up. And I'm hoping that maybe this is the year. I started looking at them and I was like, okay, there's not actually a lot of holes here. Maybe you could say the back end, but I think there are some good enough pieces there that that will get the job done. They have one of the best goalies in the West. And these forwards, it's like, I, I, I can't not love the top nine every time i look at this team like all of these guys should be scoring at will it's so it's like an exciting forward group to look at last year i think their biggest weakness 
And maybe this is because of the back end that I mentioned is their PK, but I think that's a fixable thing here and they have a great power play. So I don't know. I, I couldn't find too many holes, although I feel like I'm just a broken record saying that this team's going to be good every year and then they aren't. So <laughs> I had a hard time putting them at five, but I did. Yeah. So, I mean, I had a different team at five, but I'll talk about Vancouver because I had them at six. And like I've kind of been saying for these middle teams, I'm you know, I'm kind of indifferent. I look at this this division and I think a lot of teams could finish in any of these spots in the middle, but I'll talk about Vancouver. I had them finishing at six, but for the sake of coming together on a consolidated ranking, I think, you know, it makes sense for them to be in the five spot. Um, you know, I just, I'm just not sold on this group and they double down on it. So they re-sign guys like Miller, Besser, they're going to get Horvat done, who I think might be the most important to the group is Horvat. Um, you know, and then they've got some other guys like Pod Colson and Hoglander, and you know, those two will be able to take another step this year. So it's not like I dislike the group, but I just don't know if I fully believe in it. Like they just haven't been able to get it done and they really didn't change anything this off season. Really all they did was add Mikheyev, who, you know, can provide some depth scoring and a bit of jump on your third line and, and can play up in the lineup if he needs to and is incredibly fast, but you know, he's notorious for not being able to finish. So, like, I don't know, you know, what they're expecting this guy to be, especially for the price tag that they paid for him. So, like, I look at this team, like, the defense is is almost exactly the same. Um, you know, you've got a full year of Travis Dermott. That might be the only, uh, you know, difference in this lineup. And then you've got Demko as your your goalie, who, again, is incredible. But he's been there the last few years, and he's been really, really good. Um, but hasn't been a, a, a big difference maker, I would say, in terms of dragging this team to the playoffs. So, you know, as much as I like a lot of the individual players on this team, I just don't know if they work cohesively and they've doubled down. So and that's we'll see. That's exactly the thing, Chad, is they are individual players so far. They've all yeah. been hot just at separate times. Yeah. And I think if this team can find a way to get hot at the same time, then they can go on these huge winning sprees and and kind of do like even like the Anaheim Ducks at the beginning of the year last year. It was like yeah. we didn't expect them to be good and they didn't end up being good, but they were good for a while. And I think that Vancouver has exactly that situation on their hands with the new coach. I think they can get hot together and that's why i'm giving it one last hurrah with this, <laughs> this is the last five. one <laughs> quote me and clip it in the next season's episode do yeah. not let me have vancouver higher if they're not in fifth <laughs> no th th this team has to be better and uh you know the we certainly saw a difference after bruce boudreau came in behind the bench but uh they need to put it together for a full 82 games they've got a great core a great goaltender, uh, they, like they look fantastic on paper. It's like what we've what we said about Florida for years before they finally, um, you know, won a Presidents Trophy and got into the playoffs. And so, yeah, Vancouver needs to make some headway and and be competitive and, uh, yeah, have them in this fifth spot. But I, I think that uh, they will be playing meaningful games late in the year. Another signing I did like kind of a minor signing in the bottom six, but I, I did like the, the Curtis Lazar deal, just the, an energy guy to have in your bottom six. And he's a BC guy too, I believe as well. So um, that was, that was a, a, a nice little piece of business by, um, by Patrick Alvin. So anyway, that's the Canucks in, in that fifth spot. So let's move on to uh, who I have at number six. And again, might be a little bit of debate. We all know who we have at uh, at number eight to to finish at the bottom of this division. Um, but I've got the Anaheim Ducks at at number six. And uh, look at th this is a team that has Zegris. It has Mason McTavish, who um, could very well be the Calder Trophy winner this season. We all expect him to be on the Anaheim Ducks day one. He was last season before uh, before uh, getting sent down. And and um, uh, fantastic World Juniors, fantastic OHL season. Uh, so uh, you've got 
Jamie Drysdale, and they uh, made a, a couple of nice free agency ads as well. I, I will admit, Ryan Strom and uh, Frank Vetrano, a, a player that I really like, and um, Pat Verbeek has has done a lot of good things. You know, he wasn't afraid to to get rid of the the Lindholms and the Mansons and and so on and so forth. Um, John Gibson w- will be a, a question mark. Can can Gibson um, sort of bounce back a little bit and get back to being, you know, the the goaltender that we know he can be? Um, but I think this is another young team that can take a step and could be where the LA Kings are as soon as next season. I just don't think they're quite there yet. And so I've got Anaheim in number six, but this is a team that's going to be fun to watch, competitive all year. And they're another team that I could see playing some important games late in the year. So let's get a thought on the Ducks in that number six spot. Yeah, I mean, I I like what you're saying. I like the thought of this team being better because they're so young and they're such an exciting team. And I think they're going to be that once again this year, but I actually have them in number seven still. I don't think that they've taken a big enough step yet um, to to kind of move up. I think that when you see this team go and be so hot at the beginning of last year and still be so low in the standings by the end of it, I think that that scares me a lot. Um, I don't love their back end, and I call them the the defense academy of the Anaheim Ducks because they're like, uh, gonna, you're going to probably stop listening to me here, but they're like Ajax the Dutch football team and and they get these young players, they build them to be good players. And then as soon as they get good enough, they sell them for all sorts of money. And then they just never improve themselves. And that's what it feels like uh, the Anaheim ducks are. They, they grow these great back end players and then trade them away. And I think if they just held on to more players, they'd have the best decor in the league right now. Um, that being said, I don't love it now. I think it's a lot of guys who are not their former selves in Shattenkirk, Kulikov, Klingberg. You have a guy that could not crack it in Boston. And, and that's a place that also turns defense into great players in Vakanainen. Um, and really all you're left with is Fowler and Drysdale. I don't love their back end. You have to love their goaltending. I'm just going to move away from that point as fast as I can. And then in special teams, I don't love anything there either. So I'm excited for Anaheim. I hope they continue to get better. Um, I just don't think it's this season yet. I think they're maybe one or two seasons away. Yeah, so Case, I'm going to agree with you on this one. Uh, I've got Anaheim in the seven spot, which means the team that I had in five, who now moves down to number six on our consolidated rankings, is Seattle. So we'll talk about them after, because I think we're on the same page there, unless you have San Jose in the sixth spot, and I doubt it. So Anaheim Ducks, you know, I think they're good, and they're going to be able to take a step. But I, I agree with what you said, Harp. They're just not ready yet. And that's why I've got them in the seven spot you know i i like how they went out and got strom uh, i think that's an underrated ad to be honest uh and i like vetrano but you know there's still some some question marks like uh are they gonna re-sign sunny milano who knows if he comes back so i think that's you know another depth piece that is important to the team that they're missing right now um another thing is i don't think you can expect the same level of production from a guy like troy terry as he put up last year because Uh, You know, you look at the underlying numbers and to me, it just doesn't seem repeatable. Uh, You know, prove me wrong, Troy Terry. I'd love to see it because that's exciting for the league. But, you know, I just don't think uh, it's likely that he repeats the same offensive numbers as he did last season. I don't think Zegris, McTavish, Drysdale are able to carry this team quite yet. They're going to need a couple more years to take some more steps. Uh, And I don't think adding Klingberg on the back end uh, was something that they thought that that the ducks thought would put them over the the hump i think adding klingberg is just to get a guy to mentor some of your younger players and to be honest i think they'll probably flip them at the deadline when they're out of a playoff spot because he only signed one year that's going to be the easiest deal to move and then klingberg will go wherever he wants in free agency again and uh, he'll probably sign a bit sooner so that he doesn't get squeezed again like he did this offseason but uh and then you look at the goalies like it's the same 
Gibson's just as good as he's always been. He might be a bit fatigued from playing, you know, 70 plus games or whatever over over the last like five years straight. But he's still really good. He just needs some support. And it seems like he's going to fit their timeline over the next two, three years as they get better and better. So Anaheim's going to be good, but I don't think they're there yet. That's why I have them at seven. And I've got Seattle in the sixth spot. Yeah, that that point you had about Klingberg is exactly how I see it, too. It's like bring him in to be that mentor to Jamie Drysdale. Um, you've got guys in the system like Drew Hellison. You have, um, which blew my mind when I'm sitting there and listening to the World Juniors, that they have Olin Zellweger as mm-hmm. well. Yeah. It's like, God, this team just He's continues sick. to pick the good defense and continues to bump them out. The, the defense academy of the Anaheim Ducks. <laughs> Love that. Um, all right, so... Got Anaheim in that sixth spot. You guys have them down at seven. So let's talk about the team that you mentioned a minute ago there, Chad, that uh, you think is is going to move up a little bit. Uh, it was a rough, uh, a rough inaugural season for the Seattle Kraken, uh, but they had a big offseason. They, they added Shane Wright, fourth overall in the draft. That was a, a bit of a surprise. They had a ton of picks in that draft. Uh, they add Oliver Bjorkstrand, and I, I could be missing a few. Oh, right, Andre Burakov as well so that was a a big signing for them uh chris drieger is going to be out for a while so the goaltending will be philip grubauer and martin jones i believe to start the season um grubauer obviously had a had a rough year last year but uh i i think he he is a lot better than that i just i'm not sold on the moves that seattle have made i'm not sold on it all working out I think they'll be a little bit better. They're not going to finish at the bottom. I have them in the seventh spot, but again, I'm I'm willing to have my mind changed. So, Chad, you mentioned them. Let's go to you uh, for some thoughts on the Seattle Kraken going into year two. Yeah, so, I mean, you guys know this, and people who listen to the podcast know this. I was even big on Seattle last year, and the major problem for them was goaltending. They had league-worst goaltending. All year, no matter who was between the pipes, whether it was Grubauer, Drieger or whoever. So um, just going on, you know, the the idea that goalies are kind of random and repeating incredibly good or incredibly bad results, uh, you know, is difficult at the NHL level. I just can't see another season that is as you know, atrocious between the pipes for this team as it was last year, because I think that would be, you know, spectacular to say the least if they were able to repeat that so i think you know average goaltending for this team would do them wonders uh you mentioned a lot of the ads which personally i really like you know adding a guy like burakovsky adding uh bjorkstrand for you know picks like virtually nothing um if you're the columbus blue jackets you got virtually nothing in return for one of your best players um Shane Wright being added to this mix if he plays all year. I would expect that he would, to be honest. Um, and then adding Matty Beneers for a full season as well. So there's four guys who kind of round out your top six, or depending where you want to play them, who add to that forward group, who all have scoring touch, who all can put the puck in the net. And that was one of the other problems last year is, you know, like famously last year, I said they were going to score by committee in case he's like, well, I don't think anyone's going to score at all. And he was kind of right. They didn't score a ton of goals. So I just think that this team has improved in key ways. The big question mark for me now is still the back end on defense. I think it's OK, but they're not very mobile. You know, losing Giordano at the deadline, you know, kind of exposed their defense's mobility sort of as a group they don't really have anybody other than vince dunn really who plays meaningful minutes who can really skate and move the puck well so that's that is a a big concern for me but like i said this team along with basically all of the other ones in the middle going from you know vegas la including Seattle, Vancouver, and Anaheim, I think any of these teams can make the playoffs, and I wouldn't be surprised. And I think Seattle is just a bit of a step ahead of Anaheim, and that's why I have them at number six. I'm still not there on Seattle. Um, I think this was the biggest debate somehow last year out of all the teams. I just (laughs) would not budge. And like maybe, you know, one of the only times I've been really right on the podcast, and I feel like I was with this team. 
there's still just a lot of question marks. The whole back end's a question mark to me. Um, Goal tending is still a question mark to me. The fact that they were one of the worst penalty killing teams in the whole league last year, and they're a team full of third liners last year, that doesn't add up. So that's a huge question mark to me. Um, what I will say, though, is that they are starting to go in the right direction. They're starting to take form. They're not only third line players. Now they have a couple second line players on this team and Burakovsky and Bjorkstrand. You don't know. Maybe Maddie Beniers is a first line player already. We'll see how that turns out this year. Um, excited to see what Shane Wright can do in here. You're starting to get a center core that is kind of starting to get scary you know there's things that are stepping in the right direction i'm just still not there for them um i think that they're going to continue to make some big moves maybe uh, uh next year in the off season and th- the third season will be seattle's year yeah for playoffs you're saying to yeah. like to make oh, the playoffs. Yeah. no they're not even like <laughs> yeah. remotely close to a cup yeah so but we are agreeing on number six though because you still have them ahead of anaheim correct oh yeah 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 so then the only difference that like the only thing i have for seattle like i have them ahead of vancouver as well just because i don't really believe in vancouver but i see the arguments for for both sides there so um yeah our thoughts on uh thoughts on seattle uh i mean I kind of, you know, I kind of gave my my two cents on the, on the Kraken when I when I opened them up into the discussion, but I just the the goaltending is is going to be a big thing. Like, can Philip Grubauer get back to being the guy that he was in Washington and Colorado? It, it's it's as simple as that. And Martin Jones was actually not too bad not absolutely terrible last year on a terrible hockey team in the philadelphia flyers as the backup so um you know what it's someone to kind of be a stopgap until chris drieger comes back or they just decide to roll with those two they've they've got a three-headed monster now and and um and uh, you know i i mean burakovsky is is a guy that can score and He's won two Stanley Cups. That's a good ad. And obviously having Wright and Beneers as your two centers for years to come is something that's going to be really special for them. I just don't think they're there yet, but, um, you know, they, they did add, they've got some key veterans there, even more so than Anaheim. So I, I'd be willing to settle with them at number six and Anaheim down to, to seven. But the, the goaltending and the back end are, are the two big question marks for me. So we'll see how it goes. I'll, I'll say this about the goaltending just to finish off on Seattle. Um, Martin Jones has not been good in a long, long time in the NHL. I didn't like him as a backup option. I think he was just available. And that was, you know, someone who was out there and he needed to fill that position, you know, like you said, for a stopgap uh, before Drieger comes back. So I don't love the backup, but. You know, you look at Philip Grubauer and until last season, he, you know, was a guy who has always been above average in terms of goal saved above expected, except for one year last season where he was just abysmal. One of the worst in the entire league, virtually all season. So part of that clearly is playing on a poor team. Part of that clearly is just uh, an anomaly. So if I'm a betting man and I am, I would bet that Grubauer regresses to the mean, to his mean, like he's been you know, over the last five, six years in the NHL. So that's what I'm betting on uh, this team being, you know, at least better than they were last season. I'm, I just can't imagine goaltending that, that bad again. It just doesn't you, make sense. You can make a lot of arguments about this team to to put them higher than Anaheim in my mind, but for some reason, goaltending, well, not for some reason, it's the goaltending voodoo. Uh, yeah. I just, I can't put too much weight. I know, I know. Ever in, in either direction. Yeah. But that but that's kind of the point, right? Like last year was so crazy. You would just expect this year wouldn't be even worse. Like it would be somewhere between their average and what happened last year. You're talking statistically and logically about goaltenders in the <laughs> NHL. Yeah. I'm just I'm just saying it, it's like if if Grubauer is the worst goalie in the NHL this year again for a second straight season by that wide of a margin, that would be like a statistical anomaly that we haven't seen in decades. Yeah, no, that that would be pretty shocking for for sure. Um, 
it was it, it it was rough. But again, it was it was their first season. Like maybe like that is some is something to it. Like you know that it was the the first year for this team. So it's it's definitely going to go better for them. And uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm willing to move them up. Uh, just just above Anaheim. We'll get to our last team here to to wrap up the Pacific Division. So at the bottom, the San Jose Sharks in number eight. And I think, uh, you know, this is unanimous for for the three of us that the Sharks are going to be at the bottom of this division. And you know what? That's not a bad thing with the guy who's the projected number one overall pick in the 2023 draft. So, and not just him, but others as well. Michkov, Fantilli, the list goes on. Um, But yeah, the Sharks, new <clears throat> general manager in Mike Greer, new head coach in David Quinn, Brent Burns, a huge part of this team is out. And so uh, the team has, has kind of changed a little bit. They're starting goaltender right now. It looks like it's going to be Capo Kakinen. And it's, you know, it's the same things that we've said before about the Sharks. It's an aging group. Um you know, they, they've got a, a few talented young forwards and more coming as well. The Ecklins and the Bordelos and, and Wiesblatts and, and guys like that. Um, but but this is a team that I think is a little in denial. We've talked about how, you know, it's sort of like San Jose and Philadelphia. Like there's just they're kind of living in denial, not wanting to go through that full on tear down rebuild and wanting to stay competitive and fight for a playoff spot every year. Well, I don't know if San Jose realizes it or not, but this team looks like a team that's in a rebuild. So um, I've got them finishing at the bottom of this division just for the simple fact that all the other teams that we've mentioned just look better on paper. Um, But, you know, give this team, you know, uh, uh, another couple of years and get those young players acclimated into this lineup and another high pick and just continue to build that prospect pool up. And, you know, they, uh, I could see them having a shot at the number one uh, uh, overall pick for sure. So yeah, San Jose at the bottom of this division, a thought on the sharks before we wrap up. Yeah. The, the owners actually expect this team to have a quick like turnaround and I don't know. To me, that's a little crazy, but at least that's the the right mentality. At least they think you know it's time to start the rebuild. Although they want it to be fast, and that never really works out for teams, so um, they've got to tread carefully there. I think the only thing that stopped this team from being lower in the standings last year was goalie voodoo and um, Timo Meyer playing like a top five player in in the entire league. So I don't know if they're going to have that same carry. I don't think James Reimer is going to be, you know a good goalie like he was last year again this year so i don't know there there's not a lot to love currently on this team although they did get rid of one of their three terrible back-end contracts um yeah i don't know i don't have much to say about the team other than i'm excited for them to to kind of turn turn it around and start the rebuild yep Yeah, so speaking of contracts case, this team might have the worst contract setup in the entire NHL, especially on the back end. But getting rid of Burns definitely helps that. I think I think they only ate like 25 percent of his deal or something. So that's, you know, that's solid. Um, But then they've got Carlson at 11.5 still makes the most among defensemen in the NHL, by the way. Um, And then Vlasic, who was paid entirely too much and, you know, a handful of other guys. So it's not an ideal situation. It makes sense that, you know, they they should be thinking about embracing a rebuild because they're not going to be, you know, sniffing a playoff spot anytime soon with this group. Um, you know, they've got a decent top six up front. Uh, they don't really have any game breakers except for maybe a guy like Timo Meyer, who had an incredible year last year. And by the way, if you look at his underlying numbers, you know, as opposed to a guy like Troy Terry, that does seem to be repeatable for him, especially playing on, you know, a team where he's the guy. He gets all the minutes and he bangs and crashes and scores. So looking forward to seeing him play this year, especially for my fantasy team. But yeah, I, I don't love their forward group. I don't think anyone does. Their back end, you know, we mentioned that they traded Burns. Good for them to get that contract or at least most of it off the books. The problem is now, you know, you've that's more minutes for guys like Samek, Benning, 
Nudavara. So like that's right there is is not a good thing because those are three of your top six guys and one of them is going to have to play consistent top four minutes and I don't think any of them are very good. That whole decor, you know, used to be feared in the league but now it's one of the weaker ones in the entire nhl so i don't love that and then their goaltending like you know it's going to be more of a tandem i think with with kakinen and reimer reimer actually had a solid season last year he was pretty yeah. good mm-hmm. um and kakinen too was kind of up and down you know uh, before and after the trade so um you know I, I don't expect either of them to be game breakers as well so i think it makes sense for san jose to be in the number eight spot in this division um they're not going to be good I at least hope that with a new general manager, uh, Mike Greer, is it Harp? Yeah. The, I, I, I hope that, you know, they see the direction that this team is headed and they get ahead of it, uh, you know, before it's too late, before they fall into, you know, eternal mediocrity, which we've seen some teams do in the league. So San Jose in the eighth spot makes sense. And, uh, you know, hopefully for guys like Zach Shankar and, and fans of the team, and and Micaiah Calder, you know, hopefully things go well for this team over the next few years because this season is not. No, and like I said, not a bad thing to finish at the bottom of the division and be right there in the lottery for uh, for the guy who's projected to go number one overall in in the 2023 draft. So, all right, there we go. There's a wrap on the Pacific Division to kick off our uh, division previews for the upcoming. NHL season. Uh, crazy that summer is over and hockey is coming back already, but we are so excited. As Case mentioned, it is the most wonderful time of the year. So uh, great to be back with you fellas, and we will be back with you, our listeners, next week to chat about the Central Division. So stay tuned for that and, uh, and the other th- uh, stuff that we have coming up as well. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll talk to you again next week. This has been another episode of Boys in the Booth with Harper Cody, Chad Melbourne, and Casey Abrams. New episodes every Monday on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Connect with the Boys in the Booth on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Boys in the Booth. Visit boysinthebooth.com for show details. And don't forget, you can become a patron of the podcast for just $1 a month at www.patron.com slash boysinthebooth.